reason that I made time and insisted on coming to this conference was so that I would have a chance to sit and talk with His All Holiness. And we had a small opportunity at dinner last night, although I have to say it was a bit noisy for a really good conversation. But hopefully there'll be a few five minutes during the day and tomorrow morning. Um, I want to welcome everybody. I want to uh, bring another voice into this gathering because my life has been devoted, or a lot of my life initially, was devoted to learning about our closest living relative, the chimpanzee. And now my job is to give animals a voice so that they are understood better in gatherings around the world such as this. So I want to start us off with that, to me, most wonderful sound, and that is what you would hear if you came with me to Gombe and climbed the mountains and listened, and maybe you hear a chimpanzee calling out Good morning. <laughs> it was indeed fortunate that my childhood love of animals, my falling in love with Tarzan of the apes when I was 10 years old, led to my going to Africa, saving up my money, and meeting the late Louis Leakey, who gave me this extraordinary opportunity to go and study not just any animal, I would have been prepared to study anything to be out in the bush, but chimpanzees. And because I had no academic training at all, I left school at 18, it was difficult to get the money. It was also difficult to get permission from what was then part of the British colonial empire, Tanganyika, and the British authorities were not prepared to take responsibility for a girl to go out in the forest. No, women didn't do that in those days. But eventually, uh, we got the money, we got the permission, and I could begin the study. 53 years later, we are still learning about those amazing chimpanzees. And looking back over those more than 50 years, the thing that stands out so vividly is how like us they actually are. For example, when they greet one another, they may kiss, embrace, hold hands, pat one another on the back. When they want to, to show their dominance, they, they swagger and bristle, or shake their fist. So many of their communication patterns are just like ours. They can live for more than 70 years. The record in captivity is 74. And I met her last year. She doesn't look as though she's going to pass on at any moment. Little mama, her name is. Uh, they have a really complex social society. There are tremendous differences in personality. And this extends to differences in maternal behavior. And we find out what is so interesting to the human child psychologists and psychiatrists, the tremendous importance of early experience, the first few years of life, the kind of mothering you have as a chimpanzee infant will help to determine the uh, person you become, the chimpanzee you become as you, uh, as you grow older and move out into society. It was exciting to find that they use tools across Africa. We know that the different groups have different tool-using behaviors passed from one generation to the next, <clears throat> so we can describe them as primitive cultures. And it was a shock to find this dark side of their nature, to find that in certain situations, males will patrol the boundary of a territory, and if they see or hear neighbors, they may hunt them as they hunt animals for food, and may attack so severely that an individual will be left to die of wounds received. Infants may be killed. And this was a big shock. And you know what was the worst shock of all? Finding out they had this dark side made them seem even more like humans than I thought before. And that's a shocking statement, but it was true. But fortunately, as you said, there's also the love, compassion, and true altruism in chimpanzee society. And maybe here I just pause to, uh, to tell you a little story. I could tell you hundreds like this, but I picked just one. Imagine that we're going along a narrow trail in the forest, 
and we're following an adolescent female. She's nine years old. Her name is Pom. I, 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 I called her Pom. And her little three-year-old brother is following. Now, you're not, in de you're not uh, independent of your mother at all until you're five. You're still riding on her back and suckling until you're five. <coughs> but on this occasion, the mother is way behind us. And little prof, still a bit unsteady on his feet, is following his sister. And suddenly she stops and she stares at something on the trail ahead of her. And her hair begins to rise, which is a sign of fear or excitement. And a little, oh, oh, oh. and she rushes up a tree. Well, little brother, maybe he doesn't hear that sound. Maybe he doesn't know what it means. He comes along along the trail. And the closer he gets to this place, his sister from up in the tree, every hair stands on end. She gets a big grin of fear on her face. And finally, she can't bear it anymore. And she rushes down. She picks up her little brother. And she climbs back up into the tree with him. That is one example. And if there was time, I could give you many more. But we don't have time. But I think. After all these years of learning about chimpanzees and also learning more and more about the, diff the, the similarities between chimps and humans in biology. And these, to a large extent, have come out of work in captive chimps. And so we now know that the DNA of humans and chimpanzees only differs by just over 1%. And my, my uh, colleagues who do genetics tell me the main difference is the expression of the genes, and they can be that can be influenced by environmental factors, similarities in the uh, structure of the, the blood, the immune system, and the anatomy of the brain is almost identical. It's just that ours is bigger, and so coupling this with all the behavioral similarities. It becomes very clear that biologically there is no sharp line dividing us from them, <coughs> dividing us from the rest of the animal kingdom. It makes it very clear that we are not the only beings on this planet with personalities, minds capable of thought, and above all, emotions, happiness, sadness, fear, despair, anger, and so on. So here we are. How does that make us feel sometimes about the way we treat these other beings with whom we share, share the planet, whom we now can think of as sentient beings? Some of them sapient. Homo sapiens is not alone. So why did I leave this beautiful life? It was wonderful. I was out in the forest, which I love. I was spending time with students, doing some teaching. I was analyzing the data. By this time, I had a PhD, and I loved doing that. I was writing some books. It was ideal. Why aren't I still there? I'm not still there because in 1986, there was a conference, it was actually in Chicago, and for the first time, it brought together all those studying chimpanzees in Africa and some studying chimpanzees in non-invasive situations in captivity. And in this conference, we had a session on conservation. And I think we were all shocked, because every single field study site, they showed slides or film, and it was just being destroyed. The forest was disappearing. Turns out chimpanzee numbers had plummeted from something probably close to 2 million 100 years ago Back then, um, well, today, the number is about 300,000 maximum. And that's spread over 21 nations. So with deforestation and human population growth, the chimpanzees are disappearing. And terrifyingly, the forests disappearing as well. In the session on conditions in captivity, there was secretly filmed footage from a medical research lab showing these closest relatives of ours, who are so like us in so many ways, confined in five foot by five foot cages. Some of them had been there for 30 years. All they could expect in this bleak life was somebody in a white coat coming in and sticking needles into them because they're so like us. And yet without the recognition that because their biology is so like ours, 
Therefore, there are other ways in which they resemble us. And in some ways, we can compare shutting a chimpanzee in a five foot by five foot cage with shutting a human being in a five foot by five foot cage. They're very social. They were in solitary confinement. So when I left that conference, I didn't make any conscious decision to stop doing my scientific work. It just happened. I left as an activist. And since that day, I haven't been more than three weeks consecutively in any one place. I started off traveling through Africa to some of the chimpanzee range countries and talking to people there about the environmental situation and learning more and more about the not only the problems facing the chimpanzees and the habitat destruction and the loss of species, but also the terrible problems faced by the African people in so many cases. The crippling poverty, the growth in numbers of people to the extent that the land on which they lived could no longer support them, but too poor to buy food elsewhere. The disease, the hunger, and the ethnic violence. I thought, well, a lot of this is the legacy of colonialism and the exploitation of Africans and African resources continues today with some of the big companies moving in and doing exactly what was done in the old colonial days, leaving Africans, hundreds and thousands of Africans, poorer than they were before. I thought I'd better start taking some kind of message, I wasn't sure what, into Europe and North America and increasingly into Asia because so many of the problems that were ultimately impinging on the chimpanzees, which is where I started, were coming from outside Africa even. And so I began traveling outside Africa and learning more about the other problems the pollution, all the things we talked about last night. It was just after this that I had the opportunity to fly over the Gombe National Park where I've done all my research in a small plane. And this time, we, the plane went uh, for a very wide area around Gombe. And looking down from that plane, I was absolutely shocked to see that the deforestation outside the park, I knew it existed. I had no idea it was total. There were no trees left. The only trees were in the really steep valleys where even desperate farmers couldn't go to cultivate. And it was clear there were more people living there than the land could possibly support. There was nowhere they could go because everywhere the population had grown, as our populations around the world have grown since I began in 1960. And so the question came into my mind, how can we even try to save these precious chimpanzees if the people living around are struggling to survive? And that led to our Jane Goodall Institute, JGI program, that we called Takari, or Take Care. And it began small, like most of the projects that I've had anything to do with. It began small because when you begin something, you want to know if it's going to work before you try and make it big. So it began with a small European Union grant and 12, the 12 villages closest to Gombe. It was not a question of arrogant white people marching into an African village and saying, we're really sorry for you, uh, this is what we're going to do to help you. No, it was a team of carefully selected Tanzanians from the area who went into the villages and sat down with the people in the old traditional way and listened to them. What do you feel we could do that would help you most? And they weren't interested in conservation, not then. They were interested in growing more food, in having better health care, and education for their children. So that's where we began. We gradually, as they came to trust us, were able to introduce some of the other programs that we knew would be helpful, like protecting the watershed, uh, delivering fresh water, in a sustainable way into the village that the women didn't have to go so far to get a bucket of water or children too. Uh, Woodlots in the center of the village again so the women didn't have to spend half the day searching for non-existent firewood. They were actually hacking at the roots of the trees that they'd cut down when we began our program. 
And then I think the, the key thing that we, that we started was microcredit. And it all began because I went with Muhammad Yunus, who's one of my heroes, to Bangladesh. And he introduced me to some of the women who had had nothing when he enabled them to have a tiny loan. And he said sometimes when they took the money in their hand, it was the first time they'd held money and their hands were shaking. And when they re remembered back and told me about what it had meant to them, they all were crying. And it made a big impact on me. So we started microcredit in the same system as the Grameen Bank. Groups of women can take out loans, tiny loans, to start their own little project, which must be environmentally sustainable. That's one of the things that we insist upon. And this was very successful. And the rate of return is more than 90%. And if they don't pay the money back, then usually it's because there's been a death or something like that. And very often the other women will join in and help to pay back uh, the loans. We do provide um, information about family planning to them. And we also provide scholarships to girls because all around the world, as girls' education, women's education improves, family size tends to level off. And if you spent time in these places and seen how the sheer numbers of people are destroying their children's future, it becomes a very, very crucial element in this whole uh, field of conservation. So Takari was a big success. That's for sure. And it's meant that now the villagers are so pleased with what we've done to help them that they've turned around and become our partners in helping to conserve the forest and the chimpanzees. And they've sat down with our uh, GIS GPS specialist, Lillian Pintea, who Maria knows. Uh, she just told me he was her intern. And they arranged, they have to put some land aside for conservation in Tanzania. So they arranged this land so that it formed um, a buffer all the way outside Gombe National Park. And we've begun a corridor with other villagers now moving to the south. So this program is now in 52 villages. We're also working with the Norwegian government because down in the south, the forest is still there. So as we're restoring forest um, around Gombe, and I forgot to say, didn't I, but some of the trees now in this buffer zone are 30 foot high. And many of the other villages are allowing trees to grow throughout the village so that when you look down from a plain, you don't see these bare hills anymore. And we want to protect the uh, forests in the south, which have not yet been cut down. So we're working with a grant from the Norwegian government, uh, the Red Plus program, which is, uh, well, basically it's paying people not to cut their trees down. And it's to do with the, the carbon cap and trade. So if you're a very polluting industry, you can pay money to, so that people won't cut their trees down. I, I am not going into that in detail, to, just to say that that's what we're doing down in the south. Meanwhile, I'm still traveling throughout different parts of the planet and meeting so many young people who seem to have lost hope. I was meeting young people who were apathetic, just not seeming to care about anything. I was meeting young people who were deeply depressed and others who were angry and sometimes violent. And when I began talking to them, and these are mostly university students, young people out in their first job, sometimes high school, they all said more or less the same, we feel this way because we feel that you've compromised our future and there's nothing we can do about it. Well, I think everybody in this room will agree that that is what we've done. I've got grandchildren, and when I think how we've harmed this planet since I was that age, I feel a kind of desperation and a, a shame and an anger. You hear often this saying, we haven't inherited this planet from our parents, we borrowed it from our children. We haven't borrowed anything. We've stolen, and we're still stealing. And it's about time we get together and start paying back. But is it too late? Should we give up? Are the kids right, those who told me this? Is it too late? I've heard many biologists 
uh, liken the present situation to being on a big ship and there's a lookout up at the top and as you're going along full steam ahead he sees rocks ahead and he yells out danger danger and everybody is trying to turn the wheel but the momentum is such that there's going to be a shipwreck and I've heard planet earth compared that way many times if we think that well why don't we give up why are we all here I can't believe anybody in this room believes that because I don't think you'd be here. If you have no hope, there is no hope. I think it's true though that there isn't that much longer and there are scientists in this room who would back me up that the effects of climate change in the long term are going to be catastrophic if we don't act now, but it's not too late. So. Back to these children, I'm talking to them and thinking, well, I've got to do something, because if the children lose hope, how terrible. That's how Roots and Shoots began. And it began in Tanzania with these 12 high school students, as you said, on my veranda. And they were talking about the problems they saw in the world around them. And they wanted me to go into the schools so that there'd be better environmental education. And they wanted me to go to the government and tell them that they had to strengthen their rules and enforce the rules against poaching and so forth. And I said to them, you know, I'm a foreigner, and I know I've been here a long time, but I can't do those things. But what about you? You're 18, 19, uh, you have a voice. Do you think you could do something? What should we do? Shall we talk about it? So that's how it began, and basically, Roots and Shoots is youth driven and it involves them in themselves choosing as a group or even it can be an individual but normally it's a school group or a university group choosing three different projects to make the world a better place. One project to help animals, one to help people, one to help the environment that we all share and it's possible to weave all these into one big project and involve everybody. The main message of Roots and Shoots, because I think this is another reason for the despair that so many young people feel, every single individual matters. Every single one of us makes a difference every day. We all make choices each day, what we buy, what we wear, what we say to each other, uh, how we interact with a, a sick animal or a dying plant. Where did the food come from? How was it made? Did it harm the environment? Was it involving child slave labor? Was the tremendous suffering imposed on animals in factory farming? All of these questions, what about our clothes? Where did they come from? Was it an environmentally sustainable method that produced the cotton or not? And we can choose when we meet somebody if they go away with a smile on their face, or if they go away feeling sad or frustrated or miserable. And there are so many ways in which we as individuals can make a difference. Sometimes the problems seem too big. I think one of the reasons that people become apathetic is that they feel, well, I'm just one person, there's nothing I can do. I know many people like that. I mean, for example, if we think of some of these uh, catastrophic situations that we humans have imposed on this planet, it's so daunting. I mean, as Jonathan, I'm sure, will say, the problem of nuclear weapons, and to some extent, nuclear power, there are still parts of the world that are so contaminated that people are still getting cancer. And I still know young women in Japan who won't have children because their grandmother was affected by the atomic bomb that ended World War II. And they cry. And it's faced with all these huge problems that make us feel unable to do anything. But young people get it better. Young people understand that, no, if it was just me making these choices and trying to make them ethically, it wouldn't make any difference. But they know it's not just me. It's a growing, uh, a growing group of young people around the world. It's actually 130 countries. 
um, now. It's 130 countries. It's growing all the time. It's about 16,000 active groups. It's all ages from preschool all the way through university. And we have groups in prisons. We have groups in old people's homes. Um, we are beginning to get groups among the staff of big corporations. And so, Roots and Shoots is definitely making a difference. What sort of things do they do? Well, they get to choose, and it depends on the problems they care about and what's going on in the world around them. So you might choose to clean up a stream, take out the garbage, write letters to the polluters upstream. You might choose to walk a dog for a person who's sick and you can't do that. You might volunteer in a soup kitchen. You might uh, raise money for shelters for stray dogs, as they're doing more and more in China now. So basically, Roots and Shoots is growing a it's, it's growing a group of young people around the world who are all interconnected and who share a philosophy. They understand that we need money to live, but they know that we shouldn't live for money. And I talked to one of the teachers who began this program who said, I don't know why, but this Roots and Shoots program has done more to change the moral values of my students, even though I don't talk about them. And that was in the Bronx. There are so many stories of how this is affecting young people around the world. Many people still say to me, but Jane, why are you spending so much time now working with young people? Why aren't you still fighting for the chimpanzees? I am fighting for the chimpanzees. There is no point in our killing ourselves to save forests or chimpanzees if at the same time we're not bringing up new generations to be better stewards than we've been. And that's why I'm so passionate about Roots and Shoots, so passionate about the young people. And I'm sure there are those of you here with children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, nieces, nephews, children you care about, and you know that it's true that we have been stealing their future and that it's about time we do something about it. There's a whole other aspect here that I want to mention. When I was a child, as I've said, I loved animals. And I would spend all my time out in nature. I had a special tree in the garden, and I would climb it. And I would read books, because there was no television back then. And that was what gave me this desire to go to Africa. And everybody laughed at me. At 10 years old, way back then, World War II raging, Africa was the dark continent, and how could I, as a girl, do something like that? Boys got the adventurous chances in life. Jane, dream about something you can achieve, I was told. But not my mother. She would say, if you really want something and you work hard and you never give up, you will find a way. And I cannot give a talk without without talking about the tremendous influence my mother had on my life. I don't suppose we can choose our parents. I was just very lucky. And it was her support, I think, that helped me to become the person I am now. My grandfather, her father, was a congregational minister. He was Welsh. And there were four brothers, and they all spoke Welsh, and they all became congregational ministers. And um, I never met him, and I was really sad, because my mother talked about him a lot. And how, which was very rare in those days, in his sermons, he would talk about animals and the importance of animals. And that mostly didn't happen back then. And I've got a book of his sermons. It's very precious. <clears throat> and I think somehow some of something from his genes came down into me, or maybe it was just my mother's stories. But you know people sometimes say to you, uh, if you could have dinner with three people, who would you choose? And I always choose him as one of them, because uh, I, th I think he was just an amazing person. And that certainly spilled down to his daughter, my mother. Because we would talk about, we, we didn't go to church that often, but we would talk about God. It was part of life. And I had this wise mother who would say to me, you know, Jane, if you'd been born um, in Egypt, you'd be a Muslim. 
and you talk about Allah, it can't be any different. There can't be two great supreme spiritual beings. And so it doesn't matter what the religion is. And she never saw any conflict between religion and science. Nor did my great mentor, Louis Leakey. He spent his life searching for the fossilized remains of Stone Age man. And we would sit around the campfire when he let me go with him to Olderby and talk about science and religion. And for me, the more I learn about the, the wonder of the, of, of the natural world, the more science uncovers, the deeper it goes, the more answers we get, the more mystery is left for me. When I was out in the forest, I talked about the lovely life I had. But you know, the most important thing was this connectedness that I was able to understand, the connectedness of the living beings in the forest. And I really got to understand firsthand the importance of biodiversity, knowing that just one species disappearing could affect the whole and there could be a chain effect. And the loss of one species can lead to the loss of another, and so on. And that can lead to ecosystem collapse. <coughs> and it was more than that for me, because the more I was immersed in this forest world on my own for hours each day with the chimpanzees, sometimes just by myself, I got a stronger and stronger <coughs> feeling about connection to this great spiritual force we call God. And it was there, it was all around me. And I got this strong feeling that if I go and, and uh, cut down a tree, I'm harming God in a way. It's not my tree to harm. And once you, once you feel this spiritual interconnectedness of the natural world and us leading to, to God, you start thinking in a different way. How do we get this message out into the general public. How do we do something about this? This uh, It's almost like the death of spirit that I'm finding as I go around the world, this materialistic <coughs> lifestyle. And it makes life meaningless. It's been shown scientifically that children growing up surrounded by nature develop in a psychologically more healthy way. And that if you can re-green a part of the inner city which was high in crime rate, that crime rate will drop. We need a connection with nature. And what are we doing to our children today? There are children surrounded by concrete, and I can't help feeling there must be some just over the sea there, surrounded by concrete, who hardly ever see a tree. What is that doing to their psyche? And how can they feel connected to a great spiritual power when it's just concrete around them? I find nothing of spirit in concrete. Yes, there are beautiful buildings, but we make those less and less. We're making cement squares, cement blocks. And it's just a very sad world, this materialistic world, this Western rat race. Not surprising, really, that there's conflicts around the world. At least I don't find myself surprised because the infrastructure is falling to pieces and people are living for the wrong thing. I want to end up, I want to give you more time for questions, and I want to end up with one story that perhaps more than anything else helped me to realize how very lucky I was to be chosen to study chimpanzees. And that was uh, in about the second year of the study. It took a long time before the chimpanzees accepted me. They would run away. They're very conservative. They'd never seen a white ape before, and basically that's what I was. And so they would take one look and disappear into the undergrowth. But one of them, David Greybeard, and uh, I was telling the patriarch last night at dinner, I'm not sure if you could hear, but he had this beautiful white beard, but it wasn't a lo lovely long flowing one, but it was very like yours, you were the other side of me. And <laughs> so I called him David Greybeard. And 
for, we don't know why David lost his fear before the others, but he did. And on this occasion, he was allowing me to follow him. The chimps often travel about alone. And he was walking through the forest, and I was following him. And then he turned off the trail. You know, there are these little animal trails. He turned off the trail <clears throat> and moved through some very thick, dense, thorny undergrowth. Oh, it's easy for him for him, but I'm crawling, sometimes wriggling on my tummy. You know, we're not made for this. Thorns catch your hair. Probably better if you didn't have clothes because the thorns catch your clothes. Anyway, I thought, well, I've lost him. I oh, never mind, I'll find him another day. But when I crawled out of this thicket, there he was sitting. It looked just as though he was waiting for me. He was looking back as if to say, well, where is she? <laughs> and so I sat down near him and lying on the ground between us was a ripe red palm nut, oil nut palm. And they love these fruits. And so I picked it up and held it towards him. He turned his face away. I put my hand closer. And then he turned around and he looked directly into my eyes and reached out, took the nut and dropped it. He really didn't want it, but very gently squeezed my hand which is chimpanzee reassurance. And so in that one moment, there was absolute communication because he knew that even though he didn't want the nut, my motive was good. And I knew that he understood. And it was a very uh, seminal moment in my understanding of who I was and who they were. And this looking into the eyes, I think is so important. We do differ from chimpanzees, we know it. What's the main difference? There's lots of differences. But I think the main difference is the fact that we have this explosive development of the, of the intellect. Why? Well, the brain is the same, ours is bigger. Somehow, somewhere along our evolutionary path, we developed the way of communication that I'm using now. Chimpanzees intellectually can learn a human language. They can use up to 400 of the signs of American Sign Language. And they can use those signs to communicate with each other to some extent, as well as their teacher. But as far as we know, we are the only being on the planet that can use language in such a way that we can teach our children about things that are not there. We can talk about the distant past. We can plan the distant future, you planned this conference long ago and it's happening. And above all, most important, we can discuss. And that's what we're doing now. We can bring minds together. We can discuss problems. So if we admit, and we have to, that we are the most intellectual being ever to walk the planet, then how come that we're destroying it? It's our only home. And do you think we've lost something that I found in a lot of the Aboriginal indigenous people and in some human beings too? <coughs> something called wisdom. And I'm using wisdom in the way of when you make a decision, the wisdom path is how does the decision we make today affect our people generations ahead? And how do we make decisions so often now? We make it based on how does this decision affect me now? Or me and my family now? Or the next shareholder meeting three months ahead? Or my next political campaign? Or whatever. And so there seems to have been a disconnect between this clever brain and the heart, the seat of love and compassion. And how do we get the head and the heart joined again? The good news, it's happening. The good news, the reason that we have for hope, most of all, for me, it's the young people all around the world who are, as we speak, changing the world. The young people who, as we speak, are doing projects and not giving up. The young people who know that they're making a difference and that the world can be a better place. And then there's this amazing brain of ours. You know, we've done terrible things with it, 
and <laughs> the weapons of mass destruction are one of the worst. But we are also, with our backs to the wall, I think of the humans always when our backs are to the wall, our brains work over time to try and solve the problems. And we're getting all of these wonderful innovations out there, different <coughs> forms of energy, different ways of living our lives, leaving lighter ecological footprints. The companies, you're going to hear Gary tomorrow, Gary Hirschberg, uh, who are moving in a sustainable way so we can not give up everything that we love in this life. We have to learn to give up with some. We don't have to give up with it all. We just have to do it in a different way. And Gary's going to talk about some of that tomorrow because we were just talking about it now. And so finally, there's this indomitable human, no, no, sorry, I should say um, that ecosystems that have been completely destroyed can be restored. Life can come back, green things can grow, animals can return. I've seen it happen all around the world. And animals on the brink of extinction can be given another chance. It's not too late for the chimpanzees, the orangutans, and the gorillas, as some people say. We will save some of the forests by working in partnership with the local people and with the big companies coming in and helping. And finally, the indomitable human spirit. I think we're here because of spirit. I think spirit is what is missing in so many lives today. How terrible to live a materialistic life and not think there's anything else. It would be hard for me to live. And as I travel around, I meet so many unbelievably inspirational people who are tackling problems which seem insoluble, but they don't give up. And that's why I've got this little guy. He gets the last word. Um, his name is Mr. H, because he was given to me by a man called Gary Horn. Gary Horn went totally blind when he was 21. And while he was trying to recover and learn to live in this new black world, I've tried to imagine it sometimes. I went along a sensory trail with a blindfold, feeling with my hands. I took a, a, got a blindfold and was led by a guide dog. So I've tried to imagine what it's like. But he, when he was learning, met a magician and he said, I'd like to be a magician. And everybody said, but Gary, you can't be a magician if you're blind. He said, well, I can try. And he's so good that the children, he does shows for kids, they don't know he's blind. And then at the end, he'll tell them and he'll say, you know, things may go wrong in your life. We never know. But don't give up. There's always a way forward. He's climbed uh, Mount Kilimanjaro. He jumps out of aeroplanes. He does crazy things like some blind people do. <laughs> and he gave me this for my birthday now, 16 years ago. And uh, he thought he was giving me a chimpanzee. And I made him hold the tail. I said, Gary, chimps don't have tails. You have no excuse. He said, well, never mind. Take him where you go, and you know my spirit's with you. And so Mr. H and I have now been to 59 countries. He does get washed. <laughs> um, he's been touched by about, I would say, at least three million people uh, because I say if you touch him, some of that inspiration rubs off. And so he's now getting, oh, poor guy, he's got to have an operation, his head's coming off. <laughs> he's very frightened, so I'm hoping that from this gathering he will get spiritual encouragement to take him through his operation. <laughs> at any rate, you know, that's, that's the message I brought and trying to show how conservation can never work in the vacuum. It's no good saying, we're going to go out there and build a fence around a piece of wilderness and that'll do the trick. It won't. We have got to address the human problems, the other terrible problems that we're all here to talk about. And I tried to show how all of these things are interconnected and how Contact with the natural world and the world of spirit, moral and ethics is all important. So thank you for inviting me here. We have a few minutes for questions. 
for Jane, and then um, we'll have a break, and then we'll have our panel discussion. So questions for Jane? I want to follow up on your remark about language because I work with a three generation co reared human bonobo family. As you know, they can understand about 3,000 words of English, which is toward the upper end of what an Oxford or Cambridge graduate could do in Shakespeare's time. And when um, when they needed a house design and I was leading the design of that, we actually put them on the team because you can ask them what they want and they tell you they're quite good designers and we did interspecies design. Uh, where do you think that work is going to lead? Because I, I'm not sure we know the limits of what they can do. They may be smarter than we are because if you only had a 500 word lexigram keyboard to communicate with me because I'm too stupid to learn your Bonobish language, how would I know that you're as smart as you are? Well, you know, this, this is a, a whole fascinating topic. And um, there's a, a lot of controversy about language. And, you know, my point is, even chimps, and they haven't been taught nearly as extensively as the bonobo, uh, although there was a very interesting study, which Sue Savage Rambau did, when she had the young bonobo and the young chimpanzee, and found that the bonobos learn much quicker but they didn't remember as well as the chimpanzee. Once she got it, kept it. But anyway, um, the point is they can learn these, these man-made languages, and we can communicate with them. There's no problem in that. But out in the wild, I haven't got any, any evidence that bonobos any more than chimpanzees can you know, discuss and make plans and talk about the past. Maybe they can, but it's not obvious. It's not obvious that they can. And I, you know, what, how, how else have we, what's developed our intellect this way? Something has along the trail. And it's just fascinating, you know. And uh, these are the kind of things which you go on learning and learning and learning. And then you say, oh gosh, how stupid I was. Of course they do that. So maybe they will. That would be really exciting. But at the moment, it seems to me that this, this ability to discuss has helped this explosive development of the intellect and enabled us. I, I have to share this, this one story too because deep in the uh, heart of Gombe is a beautiful waterfall. It falls 80 feet. And sometimes the chimpanzees do these extraordinary, it's like a dance. And they're swaying from foot to foot in the water. Normally they keep away from the stream. And they'll climb up a vine and push out in the spray. And then at the end you can see them sitting and watching the water as it comes down and as it goes away. Well, what is this stuff? It's always coming, it's always going, it's always here. And is that not the kind of thing that might have led to one of the earliest animistic religions when people worshiped those things that they didn't understand, the sun, fire, uh, rain, and so forth? But the chimpanzees can't sit down and talk about it. That feeling is within them. It's within them. But if they could sit and talk about it, who knows what that would mean? 